I'm just getting a few of my things put together here. So we stopped in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 13. That is where we ended up making it to. Um, and it was because moving, we were moving five chapters a night, and we, we did all of Solomon's life in two Sundays. And it just felt like so short-lived for King Solomon, you know? And so we're like, well, let's learn about the wisdom of Solomon. Let's go. And so we did Proverbs. We did Ecclesiastes. We did Song of Solomon. And, and then we said, well, you know, we need to go back to the New Testament. It's been a long time. And we try, I try at least to get one gospel a year. We, every year we'll make it back to a gospel. And, and we really drew Luke out kind of intentionally, just kind of, I think, with COVID, 2020, and all the craziness, we just needed to have some Jesus time. So we really drew that book out longer than we normally do. And now we're back, though, and the goal is to take us all the way through 2 Kings, and we'll have the entire history of Israel up to the captivity done. You'll note that in the Bible, starting from Genesis, going into Exodus, it begins with and. In the Hebrew, it's and, and then it moves on. And then Exodus, then Leviticus, and then, and it goes. Numbers, and then. Deuteronomy, all the way through 2 Kings. It's pretty much one continual chronological story from Genesis through 2 Kings. And so when we get that done, we'll have that whole history up to the captivity done. Now, the first 10 chapters that we covered, it's really the passing of the torch from David to Solomon. Twice God shows himself to Solomon. He appears, and there's this amazing stuff and amazing promises, and he builds this kingdom of great wealth to the point where they say that silver was like gravel, right? You know, just silver, just chuck it in the driveway with the other silver because it's just not worth anything because there's just so much wealth in the nation of Israel. But then he began to marry many wives, he ended up with 700 wives and 300 concubines, which is chapter 11, verse 3. These wives began to turn his heart away from the Lord, and he began to build altars. He began to worship the gods of his wives, and eventually God removes his favor from Solomon. But God had promised David that he would not take the kingdom away from Solomon that David's son would see it to the end. But after David's son goes, God's like, at this point, people are going to have to start reaping what they have sown. And that's what we're moving into. We are moving through the division of the kingdom tonight. It's actually a nice chunk, chapters 11 through 14. We get to see how the division takes place, who's leading in the north, who's leading in the south, and a lot of great lessons along the way. So let's just dive in. Uh, chapter 11. Uh, where I'm going to start right in verse 14 where we left off. Um, again, it basically just talks about how his wives begin to turn him away. And maybe let's just read verse 12 um, because it says, Nevertheless, I will do, not do it in your days. Ah, verse 11. Back up one more. Because you have done this and you have not kept my covenant, my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely uh, tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. For the sake of your father, David, I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I'll give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Now, we're going to get kind of chugging through the first few parts because it starts just kind of wrapping up Solomon's life. He had some adversaries. Um, we don't need to dive too deep, but they start telling us about them. It says in, in verse 14, Now the Lord raised up adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite, who was a descendant of the king of Edom. For it happened when David was in Edom, and Joab, the, the commander of the army, had gone up to bury the slain after he had killed every male in Edom, because for six months Joab remained there with all Israel until they had cut down every male in Edom, that Hadad fled to go to Egypt, and certain Edomites of his father's servants were with him. Hadad was still a little child, then they arose from Midian and came to Paran. They took men with them in Paran to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house, apportioned them food, gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh. So he gave him as wife the sister of his own wife, so his sister-in-law. That is the sister of Queen Taphanes. And the sister of Taphanes bore him uh, Genubeth, his son, whom Taphanes 
uh, weaned in Pharaoh's house, and Ganubath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. So if you're a, a note taker, you might just note that 2 Samuel chapter 8 is where uh, King David does this. So you just might write that down. I have it down next to verse 15 in my Bible. Just as a note, if I want to read about David and Edom, the conquering takes place uh, in chapter 8 of 2 Samuel. And so this is a leader of the Edomites. Edomites, the descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother, they move down into Egypt and hang out with Pharaoh to get taken care of. He ends up becoming very prominent But then what's going to happen here? So he ends up marrying into royalty, living in the palace. Their kids are being raised in the palace in Egypt. And basically all that happens is verse 21, when Hadad heard in Egypt that David rested with his fathers and Joab, the commander of his army, was dead, he said to Pharaoh, let me depart that I may go to my own country. And Pharaoh said, but what have you locked with me that suddenly you seek to go to your own country? And he answered, nothing, but do let me go my way anyway. And it it basically, that's, that's the story. Again, some of these accounts are pretty straightforward, but he ends up hearing, now I don't have to deal with David and Joab. I'm going to go back and mess with his son. So this guy, Hadad, becomes a long-term uh, problem for Solomon, and Solomon will be fighting him off in the south and the southeast against Edom. Another guy, verse 23, God raised up another adversary named Rezin, the son of Eliada, who fled from the Lord, uh, from his Lord, Hadadezer, king of Zobah. That's also in 2 Samuel 8 and in 2 Samuel 10. And so he got, gathered men to him, became captain over a band of raiders. When David killed those of Zorba, they went to Damascus, dwelt there, reigned in Damascus, and he was an adversary of all Israel of the day of Solomon, besides the trouble that Hadad caused. And he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. Now, Syria, Damascus, they're still not on very good terms with Israel. Um, and there's a lot you know, of ad, uh, adminosity till to this day. But, so here's two of them. These guys, they were problems for Solomon, but now we're really moving into now the real deal, the, the, the real adversary. That's the one we need to focus on tonight, and that starts in verse 26. So, the, then Solomon's servant Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, an Ephraimite from Zerida, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this is what caused them to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the Milo and repaired the damages to the city of David, his, of his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man, was industrious, made him an officer over the, all the labor force of the house of Joseph. So that's over all of Ephraim and Manasseh, the two most powerful tribes in the north. Manasseh being very large, Ephraim being the most prominent um, And so he's in charge of all this, but then it says in verse 29, it happened at the time that when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah, who we'll see a couple times tonight, the Shilonite, met him on the way, and he had clothed himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and worshiped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chamush, the goddess, the, gods, uh, the god of the Moabites, Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon, and they have not walked in my ways to keep what is right in my eyes, to keep my statutes, my judgments, as did his father David. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, because I have made him ruler of all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you, ten tribes." And to his son I will give one tribe, that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. I'll pause there real quick. I didn't think of getting this picture for you guys, but if you ever get a chance to look at an aerial picture of Israel, maybe in your Bible you have one of Jerusalem specifically. Jerusalem has three major valleys, the Hinnom Valley, the Tyropian Valley, and the Kidron Valley. I know you all knew that, just review. But Hinnom Valley, Gehinnom, when they talk about Gehenna, hell, they make reference to this valley where they burn their trash. Tyropian Valley, you barely notice because it goes dead through the middle, 
But when you're at the temple, you're kind of walking. There's a little valley. You can tell the temple's kind of on a hill. This is kind of on a hill. So there's kind of a valley that runs right down the middle of Jerusalem. That's a Tyropian Valley. Cheesemakers Valley is another name some of you may have heard. And then the Kidron Valley is the one we're probably all the most familiar with because the Mount of Olives is on the other side, and they're always going back and forth through the Kidron Valley. But when you look at the three, it makes that W shape. And as we know, that that's the letter in the Hebrew that if you just have the, the Yahweh, the Yah, it's like his name is there. And people point out there's even a shape of the letter that would represent the name of God there in the city. Jerusalem is important to God. Jerusalem will always be important to God. He says it here and he says it more than once. I'm putting my name there. I've chosen this city for myself. It's not even just a, I'm choosing the city for the Jews for this time, for this. I mean, it's his city. And if you get a chance to go, there's something about that city. There's just something about it, being there and experiencing just that place. It is wonderful and it's beautiful. And last I checked, I'll be back with a group at least in 2023. So start saving now. But it says now in verse 37, I will take you and you shall reign over all your heart's desire and you shall be king over Israel. But verse 38, then it shall be if you heed all that I command you. If you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways, do what's right in my sight, keep my statutes, my commandments, as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David and will give Israel to you. And I will afflict the descendants of David because of this, but not forever. Solomon therefore sought to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Shishak is going to show up at the end of tonight, so keep that name in mind for sure. But here's something. If you look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, and I'll flip over there and take a quick read. You probably want to write it down in your Bible, because 2 Samuel 7 is the Davidic covenant. If you were with us when we did our end time study, and we looked at Israel, God's people, Israel. The Davidic covenant is an everlasting covenant. You'll notice to David, it's forever. He says, I'll afflict him, but I won't afflict him forever. Just notice when he makes this commandment. Notice, as you're flipping there, back in 1 Kings, he tells uh, Jeroboam, if you heed. If you heed, then you get this stuff. If then. Not so with David. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up a seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men, but my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed before you and your house and your kingdom will be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, this is passed down through David and his lineage to the Messiah. But it's just a reminder, as we did that other night, looking at Israel and some of his promises. Some of God's uh, covenants are conditional covenants. If you, then I. There's a lot of conditional promises for Christians. When we obey in these things, these are the fruits we get to see of our obedience. But some things are unconditional. I'm doing this, David, and I'm never going to change it. So that promise of King David and his lineage is a promise forever. So when the news gets out, obviously, that Ahijah the prophet says this to Jeroboam, Solomon's not happy. So Jeroboam books it for Egypt, and he hangs out with this king, Shishak, Pharaoh. Verse 41, it says... Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon and all that he did in his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? And the period that Solomon reigned over Jerusalem and all Israel was 40 years. Then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. The book of the Acts of Solomon is a book that we don't have. We'll actually mention a couple books tonight we'll read about that that we don't have them. They don't exist anymore. They did exist, but God decided we didn't need those books. I I was actually chatting with uh, the Mormon missionaries, and they were asking, you know, uh, I was asking, what are the plain and precious truths that are taken out of the Bible? You know, can you give me an example? And this is what they flipped to. They're like, well, see, there's those books mentioned in the Old Testament. They obviously were removed. And I said, no, no, they weren't removed. They were just never in there. 
They were never part of the Bible. I go, just because a book is referenced doesn't mean it belongs in the Bible. Paul the Apostle in Acts and in Timothy, uh, he, makes, he quotes uh, Greek poets, you know, pagans. They weren't, they weren't Christians. They were Greek scholars, Greek poets. So just because the Bible makes reference doesn't mean it's supposed to be there. Why would God not think we need the Acts of Solomon? I think there's a really good reason for that. We did not need one more story about monkeys and lions and gold-plated ivory thrones and all the craziness of Solomon's life. Like, it's a cool. Why? Because it satisfies our flesh because we find all that stuff really fascinating. But ultimately, no. What was Solomon's legacy? Solomon's legacy was a lost book, a rebellious son, and a divided kingdom. He was someone who had so much going for him but he let his heart wander. I will say this, and when we, when we went into Proverbs and when we finished off here, I actually believe Solomon may have repented in his last days, that he may have come back to the Lord. And I actually believe, this is my belief, that at Ecclesiastes is actually the work of a revived Solomon, that, that he's actually trying to compel people. After he's done all the stupid stuff, he's like, no, no, vanity, vanity. Let, let me know. I did it all, and I realized that I was dumb. Go back and listen if you get the opportunity. Um, it really, I think, helps enlighten that book, which can be a confusing book. But now we're into chapter 12, and we see right off the bat, we're going to learn about Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Do you know why God decided to have their names so similar? It's so you're going to have to really pay attention as I'm talking, okay? Otherwise, you'll be lost. So there's these two guys, Rehoboam, Jeroboam. The, if it helps you at all, alphabetical, J comes before R, and I go top to bottom. Jeroboam, Rehoboam. That's like what I have to do in my head sometimes to keep them right. Also, if you're a color coordinating person with your notes, I use highlighters. And so this is just a me thing. All of the northern kings get red highlight. All the southern kings get blue highlighters. And there's a reason for that. And some people know and others don't. Um, some of them thought it was because like Republican and Democrat. Like, no, no, that's not it. The North guys, they get the, they get the red. The South guys get the blue. And I can keep them all. I know where they're all from in my Bible. So Rehoboam went to Shechem. Um, Shechem is the place where Ahimelech wanted to be made king, Gideon's son. It's the place where God first speaks to Abraham in Canaan. It's where uh, there's an issue with Dinah, and, and Simeon and Levi go off and circumcise and then slaughter all the men of the town. Uh, Joseph is buried in Shechem. Uh, Joshua sets up the stone under the terebinth tree, choose this day who you will serve. Shechem's kind of a, it's an important town. And Mount Ebal and Gerizim are there. Gerizim, where Jesus speaks to the woman at the well. And Ebal and Gerizim is where in Joshua they come and they pronounce blessings and curses from the mountains. So it was actually a very central and important town that a lot of important events and coronations even take place. So Jeroboam's going up to get, or Rehoboam's going up to be, uh, for his coronation. He thinks this is what's going to happen. And so it happened, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it was that he was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of the king of Egypt, and he had been dwelling in Egypt, or fled from Solomon, he was dwelling in Egypt, verse 3 that they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, Depart for three days, and then come back. And the people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived. And he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. Verse 8. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him, and he consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer these people uh, who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which our father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall speak to the people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but make it lighter for us. And you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastened you with whips, but I will chasten you with scourges. So here's how it goes. Solomon did a lot of building. 
And you can still see some of the stuff, or at least the bases of stuff that Solomon built. He was building. He built the temple. He built his palace. He built chariots upon chariots. He built fortresses. He had all these Megiddo and other places, and Hatzor. He had places where he was putting up stuff. All these big things were happening. And so he had a huge workforce. And if we read in those first chapters, the food he had. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of animals being slain daily to feed the people at his table. And so he had to tax a lot, a lot, a lot. But he brought prosperity to the people. Like everyone was prosperous, but he taxed a lot. And so they're saying, lighten up on us. Now, the old advisors, the advisors of his father said, you know, be their servants. But the ones who raised with him said, no, 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 go even heavier on them. Here's the thing with this lesson. It really speaks for itself, but it's worth noting. Rehoboam was 41 years old at this point. He wasn't a teenager. And these people who were raised up with him, they weren't kids. I think sometimes we read this and we're imagining like a bunch of teenagers or something like that, right? He's 41. And his peers who raised with him were probably about the same age. It's not so much younger versus old wisdom. It was the fact that we had solid biblical grounded wisdom and his friends. Friends who grew up in the palace, who had gold-plated tinker toys and gold-plated you know, this and gold plated that because everything was gold and they had never worked a day in their life, you know. And so that's the idea is your friend's advice versus godly advice. And that's really what we glean out of this is that your friends may tell you one thing. And if there's anything I've learned is that my friends are really good at making me make bad choices. (laughs) And then there's godly wisdom. And what I have found is that God can speak through godly old people, godly young people, but the catch is godly people, people who know the word of God and have, ex- have experience as a Christian. You can be 80 years old and only be saved for a week. You don't have a lot of Christian experience. And yet I love the way one of my favorite pastors says it, that in these last days, God is willing to make young men old at an exceedingly fast rate. I believe because of the times we live in, God is so willing to make people grow quickly because we need people who are mature Christians. And so I don't think he's holding back. Anyone saying, I want to grow and I want to grow fast. I want to learn this book. I want to learn how to apply it. I want to have godly wisdom. God is not holding back from anyone in these last days. I believe he's quick to answer when we say, Lord, grow me, teach me, help me be usable. And so he listens to his friends, though. And so... Verse 15, or whoop, did I get to it? There we go. 12, Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day. And he says, as he said, come back on the third day. And he rejected the advice of the elders. And basically, he, he, he recaps it all, right? He says, hey, you're, you said make your yoke uh, lighter, but I'm going to make it heavier. I'm going to chastise you as scourges. And everything starts to fall apart. Verse 15 says, the king did not listen to the people. For the turn of events was from the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which he spoke, had spoken by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nabat. Now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered to the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, O David. There was already some issues. And even in David's day, he had to bring the people back together. The north wanted to leave. A bring them back together. No, one united nation. And so that was happening, and this was kind of the final straw. David's not around. Solomon's not around. We don't need to listen to you, sons of David, the people of Judah. And so it says, Israel departed their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue, but all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. Verse 19. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Now it came to pass when Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation and made him king over all of Israel. There was none who followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel, that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of, the God, of God, actually, I'll pause right there. So he's going to get an army together to try and go up and put an end to all of this 
fussiness. They don't want it. They made Rehoboam king, or they made Jeroboam king. Rehoboam wants to have this. I will mention Judah is the allotment, the one tribe. You'll notice Benjamin's with them. Why? Well, because Benjamin and Judah, there's always been a fuzzy line. In fact, if you get 10 Bible maps and look at where Judah ends and Benjamin begins, they never look the same. Because in some, it even puts Ju- Jerusalem in Benjamin. But others, they put Jerusalem in Judah, because that's just right where the line was. And so the idea is, is that Benjamin and Judah, in many ways, became like one group. They kind of commingled. Simeon, their territory was actually inside of Judah. And so Simeon, actually, many of them ended up assimilating into Judah. But elsewhere, it says that there was a season, it's just mentioned briefly in Chronicles, that Simeon moves north. We don't know where they move, but Simeon does join the 10 tribes. We also read in Chronicles that the Levites, the Levites are all going to move down to Judah, but they didn't have a land. The Levites had their little cities, but they didn't have a land. So in, in a simple form, we now have Israel and Judah. But in detail, there were Levites that moved down there. Many of the Benjamites were part of this whole thing. And so just, again, it can, when you say only Judah, then Judah fights with Benjamin, it gets a little confusing. But Essentially, it's the tribe of Judah, and Judah was always the strongest tribe, and so they were still a very powerful force to reckon with. Now, verse 22, it says, but the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and the rest of the people, saying, thus says the Lord, you shall not go up to fight, nor fight against the, your brethren, the children of Israel. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore, they obeyed the word of the Lord, and they turned back according to the word of the Lord. Who's Shemaiah? Well, he's a man of God. That's all we know. Doesn't even call him a prophet, you'll notice. He's just a man of God. It's guys like these that are just worth taking a moment and reflecting. Who is this guy? Well, it's just some guy who is listening for God to give a message He stepped out in faith to share that message, and he stopped an entire war from taking place. He wasn't a prophet. He was just a man of God. And so little things like that, they're the nuggets in here that always seem to speak to me, that God is always using people who are willing to be used. It's not always some prophet, some prominent person. It's not a hijah. We already know there's an established prophet around. But no, he picks this guy, and he uses him. And he uses them for great things. Now, we move into some of the big stuff of the division. It says, Jeroboam, verse 25, built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. And he dwelt out from, uh, he went out from there and built Penuel. And Penuel's on the other side of the Jordan, so it's probably like his, his eastern defense city. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem... Then the heart of this people will turn, return back to the Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, their Lord, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore, the king asked advice, and he made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, it is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people who went to worship there uh, before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel, he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, in the month in which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. There's a lot in here that's pretty crazy and important to know. So first off, what do we see? Well, you guys see this, here are your gods, O Israel. Does this sound awfully familiar to some of us here, right? Exodus 32, Moses is on the mountain of God. He's getting the tablets and it says he received from the, the gold from their hand. Aaron, right, receives the gold from their hand. He fashions it with an engraving tool, made a molded calf. And then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Is it not crazy 
that they're doing the exact same thing that their forefathers had done, and it didn't end well for them. It really didn't. They got stuck in the wilderness, dying there. Uh, 3,000 people were killed that day when the sons of Aaron, the, the Levites, came up. It wasn't just the sons of Aaron. It was all the Levites and fought. They were the only tribe that said, we're not going to take part in this. Because of that, they became the priestly tribe. He builds these altars. He builds them in Dan and Bethel. We're going to see in the next chapter, the one in Bethel gets destroyed. But the one in Dan stays, and it's worshiped at. If you get a chance to go to Israel, here's me in 1 Kings chapter 12 doing Bible study on site there at Dan from two, uh, a trip, I think, this year or the last trip I did. So there it is. That is the metal was built in the shape and size of the altar. The, the, the place is still there. You can go to Dan. You can see where the altar was located and they built this you know, metal one to kind of represent this is right where the altar would have sat. And it's crazy to see. You can go up there and see this. Dan is a cool place to go if you get the chance to make it up. It's very far north, so you have to have the time to make it up there on an Israel trip. But they're worshiping at this thing. There's this golden calf on it. And so here's the deal. Four things we see here, four problems. Problem number one was in verse 28. Here is your gods, O Israel. A new face. I came up, I started alliterating, so you'll have to bear with me in my rhyming scheme. But the idea is not these are two new gods. This is the God that took you out of Israel. By worshiping the calf, you're worshiping him. And today, there are still many people, churches, not churches, cults, that will misrepresent God. They start describing God in ways that does not describe the God of the Bible. And I'm not even going as far as like, I guess, again, like Mormonism where it's, you know, God lives on the planet that's off of the star Kolob and there's, I mean, there's also weird. That's really off. But even today, people misrepresent God by describing him in ways that does not describe the God of the Bible. And many people find it much more comfortable to, to worship a God who doesn't, you know, disapprove of their life, to worship a God who's okay with them never changing and just staying the way they are. You know, that's the idea. God takes you as you are, and then he transforms you. God never catches clean fish, right? You catch a fish, you clean it after you catch it. So people describe a new God, and that's false idol worship. And so today, we're just as susceptible to this. He sets up a new face, a new look for God. Secondly, it's a new place. It's not the prescribed place. The only place to worship was in Jerusalem. They would set up synagogues later, places of teaching, but to slay an animal and offer it up, you had to go to Jerusalem. Now today, is there a problem with the place we worship? No. But I will say that emphasis can be put on the place, and people can make, you know, the church the big thing. And it's true. We need the church, but the church is us. And whether we were out in the parking lot like we were this summer, we're meeting in this building, we're meeting in our houses, right? We never want to make this building an idol. So the place, just remember, it's when two or more are gathered, there he is in our midst. We are the place. We are the important part of this. But he was changing the place, not the prescribed place. He was doing it his way. Now, bear with me on this one when I say wrong race. I just wanted to make it rhyme because race isn't really the right word. But hey, notice it says in verse 31, he made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Ethnically, they were all Jews, but they were not genetically sons of Levi, right? Call it a sub race, you might say, because they were broken down. Everyone knew. I am from Judah, I am from Benjamin, I am from Issachar, I am from Zebulun, I am from... And it had to be a Levite. It had to be an Aaronic Levite to be a priest. All the Levites served in the church, in the temple, but only the sons of Aaron, his, Aaron's direct descendants, could be priests. Today, there are qualifications to be a pastor, and not everyone likes to follow those. There are things that can disqualify you just from the get-go. There are things that can disqualify you by actions you do as a pastor. You can become disqualified. And there's a temptation. Someone gets disqualified from ministry. But man, he was, 
he was so charismatic and the people loved him and, and they try and get these people back in the ministry because they brought crowds in. And I'm very replaceable. What was it, uh, Romaine? Any donkey can teach a Bible study. I used a nicer word than he used, but the point is, is, you know, the, to teach the Bible is just teaching the Bible. We don't need celebrity pastors, but the problem is, is we, we, we qualify unqualified people. We take people who can draw a crowd rather than people who are gifted by God and called by God to teach the Bible. People think a piece of paper makes them a pastor rather than a calling from God. And so you, you can't just pick whoever you want. It's something that's an, it's an ordination that God gives, not people. And so he was picking the people he wanted. Whatever, you're not a Levite, no big deal. You can come and be one of my priests too. And last not not least, my wrong pace. Once I started rhyming, I had to keep it going. Really, it was a timing thing. You'll notice that he did it on the eighth month in verse 32. The seventh month was the month where they had all their feasts. He decides, I'm gonna do it the eighth month, why not? And I will say this, that church doesn't have to be on Sundays, but it is the tradition in the Bible, it's in the book of Acts, it's, it's verified in other book, books of the Bible, it's the early church tradition, worshiping the Lord on the Lord's day, the first day of the week. And I don't care if people want to worship on other days of the week, but when they start saying that the other days are the right day and the Sunday's the wrong day, now we're running into some issues with the Bible. And so all these things do relate to us, we see with Jeroboam. But the problem is, is when people start trying to create religion that suits them rather than worshiping God in spirit and truth. And so that's the lesson we can get, what we need to be careful of as we move through this stuff. All right, chapter 13, the man of God. It says, behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child Josiah by name shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests on the, of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. I won't flip there, but if you're a note taker, I'll take that back. I won't flip there, but you're going to become a note taker. And with one of the pens that are nearby, write this in your Bible so you have it. If it's not already a cross-reference, if you have cross-references, it should be there. 2 Kings 23, 15 to 20, King Josiah is going to show up on the scene 300 years later, and this exact thing is going to happen. So we'll get there when we get to 2 Kings. So I don't need to read the story now, but you want it in your Bible here, 2 Kings 23, 15 to 20. Again, it's about 300 years later. Verse 3, it says, And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes shall be poured out. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his arm for the altar and says, Arrest him! And then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered so he couldn't pull it back to himself. It just shrivels. And now he can't even move it. Verse 5, it says, the altar was also split apart. The ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And everyone's standing around looking, going, well, you arrest him. No, 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 you arrest him. I'm not touching him. No, you get him. King said, get him. You got to go get him. I'm not getting him. You, you know. And then verse 6, the king answered and said to the man of God, please entreat the favor of the Lord your God. Hear how Jeroboam is now referring. It's not his God, it's your God. And pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God entreated the Lord. And the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. And the king said to the man, Go, come home with me and refresh yourself. I'll give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go on with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink with water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, you shall not eat bread nor drink water, nor return by the same way. Verse 10, so he went out another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. This story, I think at the very end, it's got some really great lessons to glean, but it reads pretty straightforward. This is a younger uh, man. He's called by God. We never know his name. He's just called the man of God. He shows up and he's got power behind his message. He's got the miracle to back up the prophecy and he says what's gonna happen. We know that it did come to pass. They didn't know that. And he was told by God, you cannot stay there. 
don't eat, don't drink, and go home a different way. That is what he said. And the prophet made it known to them all that that was his orders, right? Like, this is what I was told. Tell you this and do these things. So verse 11 now. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel with his sons, and, came, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, well, which way did he go? For his sons had seen the way which the man of, God, uh, man of God went who came from Judah. And his sons said, saddle the donkey for me. Or he said to his sons, and they saddled the donkey and he rode on it. He went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. I cannot return with you nor go with you. Neither can I eat or bread nor drink water for, for you in this place, with you in this place. Verse 17, for I have been told by the Lord, the Lord, you shall not eat, drink, etc. So he says to him in verse 18, well, I too am a prophet as you are. And that's what it said up above. He was a prophet. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. He was lying to him. There we go. Rat row. Now, I will just start with this because we'll move on. This story's got a lot packed into it. We're warned in the New Testament that even if an angel comes and preaches a different Jesus, do not listen and I call him accursed. And it's funny because that is, I don't know why the Mormons have come up a couple times tonight. That's not normal necessarily, but it seems to tie in. You know, that's their story is that an angel appears to Joseph Smith and gives him the the Book of Mormon and all the tablets and all that stuff. And he runs off sprinting into the woods with 500 pounds of tablet under his arm. And, you know, that's that's how the story goes. And this is the thing is this guy's lying about an angel. And so let's just watch the story as it unfolds, though. So he goes, right? He goes back with him in verse 19. And verse 20, it says, and it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he, the prophet, cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept my commandment, which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, ate bread and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, eat no bread, eat, drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. So it was after he had eaten bread, after he had drunk, that he saddled a donkey for him, and the prophet whom he had brought back, for the prophet whom he had brought back, and when he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown in the road, and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse. And there men passed by the road and saw the corpse thrown on the road, and the lion standing by the corpse. And they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Now, when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, he said, Is it the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord? Therefore the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he has spoken to him. And he spoke to his son, saying, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. And then he went and he found the corpse thrown in the road, and the donkey and the lion still standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn and bury him. Then he laid the corpse in. Uh, then he had laid the corpse in his own tomb, and they mourned over him, saying, "Alas, my brother!" And so it was after he had buried him that he spoke to his son, saying, "When I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried, and lay my bones besides his bones." For the saying which was, he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines of the high places which are the cities of Samaria will surely come to pass. Kind of a weird story, huh? But actually, it it makes a lot more sense once we dive in and and remember some things I know many of you already know. Firstly, what's up with this old prophet, right? I mean, he lies to him blatantly, but then God starts speaking through him. He starts to prophesy. The Spirit comes upon him. He starts prophesying. And the old prophet, I mean, it kind of ends well, you might say, after, you know, killing this guy, or leading him to his death. You know, in that right there is a reminder that godly people, real godly people, used by God, called by God, make some really bad choices. We're all prone to it. We're all capable of doing the stupidest of things, like killing another prophet on accident. 
But I mean, it's, it's, it's real. And here's the other thing. Just because we make the stupidest mistakes doesn't mean God's done with us. Doesn't mean I'm forever disabled from ever being used by God again. God ends up speaking through this prophet the same day he leads this other prophet astray. Well, it's just a reminder. God is gracious. He'll continue to use us. And it just seems so weird. And this old guy, freaking, we, the, the man of God has never called young, but he's contrasted by an old prophet. So it, it just seems logical that the other guy was younger, contrasted to the old prophet. Maybe the old prophet hadn't been used in a long time. Maybe he was jealous. Maybe he was, in, and in his jealousy, in his whatever, he calls this young guy in to kind of be curious, and, and he has a bad idea to lead him astray, but then maybe it just hits him. What did I do? And then God speaks through him. The old man repents, and God starts to use him again. And in the end, he says, listen, bury me next to him because there's going to be a resurrection and when that resurrection happens, I want to be the first one to say, I'm sorry to this guy. Just put me right next to him so we pop up together. Like, listen, I'm really sorry about that whole, you know, an angel talk to me thing. I hope that we can still be friends in heaven. The young man of God, why did God kill him? Because as Uncle Ben Parker said, with great power comes great responsibility. There's my Spider-Man plug for the day. Um, you see, it's true, though. We, we should know James 3.1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive the stricter judgment. When you're in charge of teaching the word of God, God's going to hold you accountable to the things you teach, to the things you say. They might not have understood that, but you knew better. And throughout the Bible, we actually see those whom God calls to great things, he holds to a very high standard. What was this guy's commission? He was prophesying against all the northern tribes. Truthfully, he was called to set all of Israel north on course. He was given a great responsibility. What would happen if he tells Jeroboam, Thus saith the Lord, Josiah's coming, all this stuff's going to happen, and I'm not allowed to eat or drink. And then people find out he ate and drank, and nothing happened. What do you do with the first prophecy then? Sure, the shriveled hand, and the, but it's like, well, God didn't make that other stuff come true. But when they find out, yeah, homie stopped for a snack, and God just killed him. We better listen when God says and warns, like, yeah. With that responsibility, it, he had to do it because he was given this great task to do. Now, how does such a, a promising young man, this young man of God, I mean, it's, you know, if I could have a title, that's a pretty cool title, right? Man of God, like, I'll, ta I'll take it. I'm a taker. How does he fall into what is really false prophecy, is it not? It was, someone told him that an angel, and he falls into false doctrine or false prophecy. You know what? Every one of us, could be caught by false teaching, false doctrine. There's no one here that is just so well-versed, so spiritual that you could not be tricked and duped if we get lax. Peter says, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Pay attention, be watching, test things. Don't just listen to that bald guy and believe everything he says. Better back it up with the scripture and go make sure he's not making this stuff up. Chapter earlier, Peter says in verse seven, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. You know, I think there's a certain responsibility if we believe we live in the last days. Being a Christian in the last days is a certain level of, of responsibility because, you know, it's like, the last two minutes, it's overtime, whatever sport you played, right? And we all had something where it's like short time. And you train for that. You train for like that overtime part of the match. You train for the last two minutes of the football game. You train for the, and we ought to be living and training in such a way. It's like the time is short. This is what we've been getting ready for is, is not just slowly, you know, petering out and cr on cruise control, but no, like acting like time is short. I got to live this way. But the end of all things is at hand. This verse has just been like my jam for like the last year. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Old King Jimmy says, study to present yourself approved. 
I, I often will actually quote this, and I will say, study diligently to present yourself approved to God. Because that's kind of what it's saying. It's a little bit of both. The idea is, is as we study this together diligently, that we can have a boldness and know we don't need to be ashamed before God because I understand what God wants and I know how to do it. And it's coming through rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I need to know that prophets don't change what's already been spoken. Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22 the test of the prophet. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So false prophecy was a death sentence, just worth noting. And if you say in your heart, well, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is a thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and you shall not be afraid of him. I am very leery of ever using that phrase, you know, thus saith the Lord, and then prophesying. Because the Bible says, <laughs> if it doesn't come to pass, that's a big deal. On the flip side, I have received messages, and I have seen people share a word from the Lord, and you watch that take place, and you know there was nothing but supernatural in it. But we need to be able to test things when we can rightly divide the word of truth. In fact, my wife was sharing with me some of the book that the ladies are reading for the women's Bible study and talking about like, you know, why we study the Bible and all this stuff. And one of the big points is so you can identify false doctrine. And that is, we study so that when someone comes and says, an angel told me, you can be like, baloney. Because thus saith the Lord, and I just read the Bible. You know, you can say, thus saith the Lord and read the Bible and you're never really wrong. You use context and stuff, hopefully you're getting right. But I mean, can't really miss on that one. Thus saith the Lord. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned for in Judah. Boom, done. When? The more we can quote the Bible, the more we can really prophesy, which is really just speaking forth the word of God. Yes, there's supernatural prophecy that's different than just reading the Bible. But I'm saying it's a nice safe bet. I like to hedge my bets sometimes, you know, make sure it's all good to go. Verse, oh, wait, one last thing. I forgot because this is kind of important and on my heart, and maybe a few of you know why it's on my heart, because it's on your heart too. How do we handle it when better God fall? What do we do when those men we looked up to fall? It's hard. Like, it's mind-blowing. I'm not naming names, but for those who know, right, it's just like, man, what do you do when the people you looked up to, you quoted, you read their books, and they fall. They fall bad. It's hard. You know, and one thing to remember about this man of God, the prophecy he said was true. He was a tool that God used, and every word God spoke through him was just as true after he died. It was just as true after he fell. And that's a reminder for us, is that God uses broken people. God uses messed up people with addictions and people with bad tendencies and bad choices. And it doesn't disqualify what they did if they end up disqualifying themselves. So take that and, and use it when you need to, to remember. It doesn't mean that everything was said was wrong or false. I have numerous pastors, it's sad that I can say numerous now, whom I have followed in the past who are no longer fit to be pastors because they got caught up in stuff. They're disqualified, but it doesn't mean their Bible studies weren't good. It doesn't mean I didn't learn the word of God from these guys and didn't grow from it. But it's something we wrestle with. So that was something I gleaned as I was reading out of this chapter. We didn't quite get the chapter over, though. Verse 33, after this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way. So even after the shriveling arm, the, the, it's amazing because people say, you know, show me a miracle if God would just do some more miracles, everyone would change. Yeah, the whole Bible's full of the story of God shows miracles and people don't change. So it says that he made priests from every class of people in the high places, whoever wished. Isn't that awesome? Hey, Sarah, want to be a priest? <laughs> You're in. Isaac, priest? Yep, done. Let's just hook everyone up here. We're handing out priestly robes. I mean, it says whoever wished he made a priest. This is ridiculous. You can go online and, you know, just 
do stuff. You can marry people and do all sorts of things. I mean, that's it's actually no different today, ironically. But anyway, it's just craziness. But he consecrated them. He became, uh, and he became one too, because why not, right? They're selling the robes on Amazon. He just picked up a pair. And then uh, it says, this thing was a sin in the house of Jeroboam, so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. Chapter 14 will move a little bit more quickly, but there's some really great nuggets there too. So finishing up chapter 14, 31 more verses. At that time, Abijah, my underline, I could barely read it, it was Ahijah, Abijah. Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. Just a small note, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, Jeroboam's son, Abijah, Rehoboam's son, Abijah. You got to pay attention. <laughs> They're both Abijah. There's two Abijahs in here. Okay, Jeroboam said to his wife, please arise and disguise yourself that they may not recognize you as the wife of Jeroboam. Go to Shiloh. Indeed, Ahijah, the prophet, is there who told me that I would be king over this place. I'll also take with you 10 loaves and some cakes, a jar of honey. Go to him. Old men love honey, I guess. And he'll tell you what will become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so. And she arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were glazed by the reason of his age. Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Here is the wife of Jeroboam, coming to ask you something about her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus you shall say to her, for it will be when she comes in that she will pretend to be another woman. And so it was when Ahijah heard the sound of her footsteps as she came through the door, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another person? For I have sent, been sent to you with bad news. A couple little just mini nuggets. First off, God always sees you coming. You really don't sneak up on him at ever, right? And it's funny how you think you're going to him and it's actually, he says, I just, I've been sent to you. Well, I thought I was coming to you. Nope, I was coming to you. You were just doing the walking for me. God's in control. God knows it all. Church, You can fool many people in this room by wearing a mask, but you'll never fool God. God will always know who you are, how you feel, what you believe, what you doubt, what you struggle with. And if you really want to make some headway with the Lord God Almighty, just come to him earnestly, transparently. You know, um, we see this word a lot in, in the New Testament, a hypocrite. And the Hippocrates in the Greek, that was actually the Greek word used for the actors in the Greek plays who would have the masks they'd wear. And it was the one who was behind the mask is what the word means in the Greek, to be behind the mask. So a hypocrite, where our English word comes from this, is to be behind the mask. And they put the smiley one on, they put the frowny one on, and that's what it means, to be a hypocrite. You know, there's our technical definition, but there's the biblical way, just to be behind a mask to pretend you're someone you're not in front of everyone else. That's what she tries, and it doesn't get her very far because God knows, and you can fool us, but you can't fool him. And so verse 7 says, Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you ruler over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David, gave it to you, and yet you have not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, who followed me with all his heart to do only what was right in my eyes. I wish I had the record screeching sound, right? David? Just side note, right? David? Adulterer David? Murderer David? Yep. Because David never changed gods. Committed adultery. Murdered to cover it up. But he never changed gods. He made a lot of stupid decisions, but he always knew who his God was, and that's all God cared about in the end. Verse 9, but you've done more evil than all who were before you. For you've gone and made yourself other gods, molded images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I will bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I'll cut off Jeroboam every male from every male in Israel, bond and free. I will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as one takes away refuse until it's gone. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Jeroboam and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. For the Lord has spoken. Arise, therefore, go to your own house, where when your feet enter the city, the child shall die, and all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. 
And this is kind of worth noting. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. For he is the only one of Jeroboam who shall come to the grave because in him there is found something good toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who shall cut off from the house of Jeroboam until this day. What? Even now, for the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to the fathers and will scatter them beyond the river. This is talking about the Assyrians. He's already uh, prophesying about the Assyrians coming in to scatter the northern tribes because they've made their wooden images provoking the Lord to anger. He'll give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who sinned uh, and who made Israel sin. Then Jeroboam's wife arise, departed, came to Tirzah, and when she came to the threshold of the house, the child died. And they buried him, and all Israel mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through his servant Ahijah, the prophet. I want to note that the word child, it's the same word, um, na'ar. It's translated lad. It's translated youth. It's also translated servant a lot. In Genesis 22, where Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac, that same word in verse 5 is Isaac, the lad. In verse 3, it describes the young servants who are carrying all the wood and helping with the donkeys. My point, I don't think it even makes sense that this is a baby or little child because it said in verse 13 that God had seen something good in him. Now, we can definitely see good in little children, maybe not mine, but, you know, others, you know, my children are crazy. But, but you know what I mean? Like, I, I think this could, this could be a teenager. This could be an early 20s, actually, is what this word can mean, right? So he was a young man, I believe, a youth. And he was sick, and God let him die. It says here that he's the only one who was going to get to go to the grave, because there was something good I see in him. Well, if there's something good, God, why did you let him die? And I'm sure all of us at some point or another will have that very question. If, well, then why did you let them die? A verse that's probably good to have all of us just you know, in the back of our, our pocket. The righteous perishes, and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil and he shall enter into peace. It moves on from there, but the Bible actually says that God will actually remove good people to remove them from the evil of this world and to be moved into his presence. It's a bummer for us. It's not for them. And so it's interesting that this young man perhaps maybe was promising. Maybe he could have, maybe he would have tried to live for God and God's like, you know what, kid? I'm just going to take you home now because the rest of your family is not going to be real, doing well. And so God lets the kid die. But it's just a good word. It's a good reminder. For those who have Jesus, it's not goodbye. It's just see you later. And they get to enjoy an amazing party while the rest of us are down here doing all the hard work. And so remember that as we continue to go through the Bible and as we go through life and we, we have to face these things together. We're wrapping up now. Death of Jeroboam, two verses. The, the rest of the Acts of Jeroboam, how he made war, how he reigned. Indeed, are they not written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel? We don't have the chronicles of the kings of Israel. Chronicles that we have is the chronicles of the kings of Judah mentioned down in verse 29 at the end of this chapter. So just FYI, there's two different books. And the period that Jeroboam reigned was 22 years, so he rested with his fathers, and Nadab, his son, reigned in his place. You can do a red highlight on Nadab. Um, and now from here forward, I'm just going to mention that there's a pattern we're going to see in the rest of the, of the two books, that some nights we might move kind of quickly because they, there's an introduction to the king, who's their mom, how old they were. I mean, this is actually every king, their mom, how old they were, when they started reigning, uh, who was the king in the other nation? So if they're talking about a northern king, they'll say who was reigning in Judah. If they're talking about a Ju Judean king, they'll talk about who was reigning in Israel. And then they'll hit whatever points of significance there are. Some kings, there's like none. I mean, they really just move very quickly, and there might only be a handful of verses dedicated to one of these kings, especially the northern ones. And then they'll summarize at the end. 
there'll be a summary of, and he was this many years old when he died, and he, died, he reigned for this many years. So I'm just pointing out this, because you'll see this again and again and again, and I haven't gotten there yet, but I mean, I might move very briefly through some of these, because it'll be kind of the same again and again, and I'll make sure to highlight the key points, but unless you guys all really want, you know, the entomology of everyone's mom, I can try and work on that. But chapter 14, we're coming to an end. Here we go. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name, see, I told you guys, was Nama of the Ammonites. So his mother was an Ammonite, and they they had some wicked stuff they worshipped. The Ammonites descended from Lot, which daughter was the older or younger? Bonus points. Younger. younger. I needed to start telling you you can't answer, Pam. That's just not fair. Um, so it is the younger daughter. And the other people who descended from Lot are the, no, Pam. Moabites. Okay. See, this is good stuff. There'll be prizes someday, I think. Okay. In verse 22, now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him jealousy with their sins, which they committed more than all that their fathers had done. Now, this is talking all the way back to Egypt. Like, they're saying, like, no one has ever been this wicked in all of Israel. For they also built themselves high places, sacred pillars, wooden images on hills on every, under every green tree. And they, there were also perverted persons in the land that did according to the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel." I'm not going into depth on any of this stuff, but if you want to understand the perversion of what goes on here with Molech worship, the sacrifice of children, all of the weird sexual practices that were involved with all these things, certain ones, there was this, certain ones, it's just worth noting in my Bible, this is printed in my Bible, in verse 24 where it says perverted persons. Gadesh is the Hebrew. It says, one practicing sodomy and prostitution for religious rituals. Now, there was heterosexual and homosexual. There was this, there was that. It was across the board. There was something for everyone. And this was being promoted, and it was being made normal and acceptable, and you began to be considered, you know, kind of a bigot or weird if you didn't agree with the practices Sounds kind of strange, huh? But that's the thing, is that society went this way. All of society turns, and God's not happy. And it happened in the fifth year, the king of Rehoboam, verse 25, that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away the gold shields which Solomon had made. The king, then King Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place and committed them to the hands of the captains of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. Whenever the king entered the house of the Lord, the guards carried them and then brought them back into the guard room. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam, are they not uh, written in the chronicles of the kings of Judah? We have that. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. So Rehoboam rested with his fathers, was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Namah. The an Ammonitus and Abijam, his son, reigned in his place. I guess there's Abijah and Abijam, but it, other places call him Abijah for what it's worth. So he went by both. Now, the last thing in this chapter that's fascinating, and, and I found it kind of cool King Shishak. Remember, I said we'd hear from him again? Where did we hear about him earlier? Well, a few chapters ago, right? Shishak in chapter 11, verse 40. He's the one who Jeroboam went down and stayed with, right? He stayed down there in Egypt. And although that story about, hey, dad, which didn't seem all that important when we read it, but you saw what happened with hey, dad. Hey, dad, the Edomite went down there and he ended up actually becoming prominent and making friends, getting, he married the Pharaoh's uh, sister-in-law. We got to assume Jeroboam may have had a similar deal. A prominent figure goes on down to Egypt, living the high life, and eventually Jeroboam went back, just like Hadad. Well, now Shishak invades Israel, and he takes everything away from the house of the Lord. So this is kind of cool. Karnak is one of the largest archaeological sites in Egypt, and it's cool. Yes, there's a picture up. And in Karnak, 
This is where uh, Pharaoh Shoshank the first, which would be kind of like, just like any language, you go from Spanish to English, the names are very similar, but they're a little different, right? Shishak in the Hebrew, Shoshank in the Egyptian. This is where that guy reigned. And this is the, the leftovers of part of his kingdom, Karnak being one of the cities right next to Luxor, you know, from Vegas. And uh, he had a sub, you know, he had a, a city in Vegas he had too. Um, but there in Karnak is what's called, I don't know if it's the Bubasite or the Bubasite portal. It's a big inscription. On this inscription, it lists off the achievements of Shoshank the first, of which was when he gathered up Egypt and he went on into Israel and all the conquering he did that we read about here in 1 Kings 14. Couple interesting notes. It doesn't mention him sacking Jerusalem. Scholars believe that is because uh, Rehoboam bought him off. Like he never sacked Jerusalem because he gave him all the gold shields. He gave him all the stuff to leave them alone. So Jerusalem's not on the list. But what is interesting is cities like Bet Shan and Megiddo are on the list. And if you know your geography really well or you've been to Israel, you know Bet Shan and Megiddo, that's way up in Israel proper. That's far north of Judah. And so seeing this, it kind of just, as a closing note, it made me think about it. It's like, you know what, man? You might think you can go and live in Egypt, which is a picture of sin and bondage. It's a picture of the old life. I can go back to the old friends. I could go back to the old ways just for a while. And I can walk away untouched. I can walk away unscathed. Like, it's not going to have an effect on me. And years go by or whatever happens. Something, you know, here, time passes. And now his homie that he was staying with, Shishak, he's now up raiding in his own territory. It's just that reminder that sin will come back to bite us. And we get born again. Our sins get washed away. We should probably just stay away from those old places and those old people and those old things because they just come back and create problems later on. And so it's just fascinating to see that this guy ends up making it up. We have it in archaeology to show us, you know, the Bible's real, duh. But hey, I mean, it's cool that, you know, all these things that we find. There were a lot of cool little highlights tonight, a lot of little one-liners and things to consider. Let's worship our Lord. Let's pray. Let's seek his face and ask him to to do the work in our hearts that we need. Father God, I, I thank you. Uh, for another night of just seeking your